Blockchain, AI, FinTech, changes in the economy, trust, digital identity. What are these things? And what do they mean for us? Because that's what matters. Today on CXO Talk, we're speaking with David Schreier, who is a futurist. He is a man with many talents and many interests. And, you know, he's going to read the future for us. Hey, David Schreier, how are you? Thanks so much for joining CXO Talk today. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael, for having me. And I'm really excited to speak with you and your audience about what the future holds. So, so David, tell us briefly about the scope of your interest. It's pretty extraordinary, actually. Well, I, I've been really lucky because I'm, I'm a little bit of a geek groupie. I like hanging out with really smart people and learning from them where things are going. And so, uh, so I have a dual appointment at, at the MIT Media Lab and at University of Oxford, uh, Said Business School. So, so I get to hang out on both sides of the pond with some people who are not just envisioning the future, but actually creating it. Uh, so one thing we like to say at the Media Lab is the best way to predict the future is to create it. And, and then I also run a, a software company that I spun out of MIT called Distilled Analytics. Okay, so, so really quickly, tell us what, what is Distilled Analytics? Give us the you know, 15 second pitch. Yeah, so we're an AI biometric software company. We create digital identity profiles for financial institutions to help them work better with their customers around things like making loans or uh, securing their data systems or managing risk. Uh, and so, uh, it's a big problem. There are three and a half billion people in the world who are not well served by our current financial system, and we're trying to help. Okay. And you also wrote a book. Well, you've written a number of books. This one is called Trust and Trust Colon Colon Identity. And we're going to be talking trust, trust data. Sorry about that. And we're going to be talking about this topic as well during our excursion in the next 45 minutes or so. So, David, you're an entrepreneur, you're focused on innovation, you're focused on business models, and I've just thrown out a whole bunch of buzzwords. So, let's begin with startups. What are the implications of all of these changes for somebody who's starting a company or they're running a company, they're looking to raise money? Tell us about that. It's a really exciting time to be an entrepreneur. So the implications of all these different technologies of, of AI and blockchain and, and, and digital identity and, and all of the, the transformational technologies that are now uh, uh, engaging with multiple levels of society are that there are going to be inefficiencies that emerge. There are going to be challenges that big companies can't move fast enough to, to grapple with. And that's where an opportunity arises for entrepreneurs, someone who is nimble, someone who can see a little further ahead, and someone who's not bound by all the red tape that wraps around big companies. Um, so I think the next five to 10 years are going to be a tremendous opportunity for someone who has entrepreneurial spirit. What should entrepreneurs do to take advantage of these disruptive changes? Well, the first thing, and it may sound facile, but many people forget it, is just solve a problem. Figure out what problem are you solving specifically and where do you have some unique advantage to pursue it? So you might have novel expertise or insight. You might have invented some new technology. Somehow, you need a way of solving a problem that is, is impacting a lot of companies or a lot of people. And, and once you identify your problem, then you can help build out a business around, around your solution. Is there something that is unique today about the, these disruptions, right? Because the notion of solving a problem, that's that's sort of timeless advice, but what about today? Well, there are brand new technologies emerging that, that uh, large organizations are still struggling to get their arms around, right? So blockchain is a great example. That is a, a, a new kind of database. Essentially, it's a distributed database technology. It's something that uh, uh, is very interesting, not only for the financial services industry, but for a number of other industries, whether it's uh, uh, consulting or transportation or healthcare. And, and the large organizations still haven't sort of figured out what they're going to do about blockchain. And that realm of the proliferation of new technology and the opportunity for nimble experimentation is where entrepreneurs really shine. You can try out a lot of different ideas quickly without having to go to a committee and go through nine rounds of budget approval. Um, and so, uh, uh, so within these sort of broad categories of oh, big tech, lots of disruption, um, I think there are going to be some novel solutions emerging 
where the ability to rapidly iterate different experiments around solutions, for example, with blockchain, we still don't really know what its best killer app is. People are still figuring that out. So I'd like to say about blockchain, it is both less uh, and more than people say it is. In the near term, it's a lot less than the hype. In the longer term, I think the impacts are going to be more profound. Yes, and we'll be talking more about blockchain as we go forward, uh, for sure. So, so just to close up advice for entrepreneurs, what is, you've been doing this a long time, you talk with a lot of people, what is the kind of, the, the essence of what advice you would offer? Build something fast, get it in front of people and get their feedback. I'm a huge fan of the market discovery process where you go out and you actually talk to customers and you see if that idea you have about the problem that you're trying to solve is actually viable. So don't just sit in a room or you know, make business cards and say, look, I'm an entrepreneur. Actually build something and go out and show it to people and try and get them to use it. And of course, the great innovator Steve and, and teacher uh, Steve Blank says, Get out. What, what is his phrase exactly? Uh, get out of the office. My, my favorite one is that he says that startups are search engines for business models. Uh, but, but absolutely, you want to get out of the, get out of the office and, and find out from talking to customers what, what is the problem that you're solving and is the solution you came up with really viable. All right. So we've just been talking about startups. Now, let's turn to large companies. How should large companies be thinking about, large organizations, about these disruptive issues you were just describing? The dynamics are completely different for a large established business than for a startup. You know, if I wanted to, to uh, be uh, 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 clickbaity, I'd say, be afraid, be very afraid. Um, but, but less facetiously, I think big organizations need to take these new technologies very seriously. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for corporate innovation, which does require risk-taking. Big companies need to increase their failure tolerance for small-scale experiments, try out a lot of different experiments. 80% of those experiments should fail, or you're not being experimental enough. And you want to try and figure out how you can reposition your organization for this new future. And the, the, the impacts are going to be profound. So, for example, in financial services, uh, we think there could be anywhere from 30 to 50% of jobs lost in the next seven years. Uh, so, so two to six million jobs just in the US, uh, North America, and, and Western Europe from disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence and blockchain. Um, in the transportation industry, you know, autonomous vehicles uh, are going to replace long haul trucking. 5% of employment in the US is going to be upended as a result of automation. Um, in the healthcare industry, opportunities for improving quality of care and dramatically reducing cost can emerge from using combinations of technologies like artificial intelligence and blockchain. And that's, you know, $3 trillion plus in the U.S. and 5 to $6 trillion globally. Um, that's a lot of dough that is going to be uh, um, undergoing uh, movement, dislocation, and, and, and repositioning. And so big companies have opportunities to carve out new markets as well as new market share if they're smart about the adoption of new technologies. Okay, but David, we all know that big new, yeah, so, so if companies are smart, but we all know that companies on a visceral level, kind of big companies kind of hate to innovate because it disrupts their existing revenue streams and they say they want to innovate, but it's not so easy. It is difficult. You know, Clyde Christensen wrote about this very famously in The Innovator's Dilemma, where you get really good at doing one thing, so, so it's hard to try something new. Um, what I see a lot is something I call the corporate immune response, where when a new idea comes up, the white blood cells of the company come and attack it and kill the new idea. Yeah, the, corporate, the, the antibodies, corporate antibodies. you you got you to gotta, uh, uh, create systems that help protect that new idea from, from the corporate antibodies. But it, it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, some large organizations have figured out ways to embrace new technologies. So, for example, uh, uh, I was on a, uh, a panel last, uh, last January at, at World Economic Forum in Davos with the CEO of, of Accenture in North America, and they very... Uh, um, fervently and widely embraced artificial intelligence and adopted it into their organization. But they did something really enlightened that a lot of companies don't do. 
they took 60% of the cost savings that they got from, from the labor change around artificial intelligence, and they invested it in reskilling. They said, okay, we've got all these people. It was expensive to find them, expensive to recruit them, expensive to train them. Now that we've got them here, rather than just throw them out of work when we adopt AI, we're going to repurpose them for higher order tasks. Um, so it is absolutely not impossible for big companies to innovate, and it is not impossible for big companies to embrace new technology. It is difficult, and it requires courage, leadership, and a willingness to allow small failures along the way to finding the big success. You know, we've had on this show uh, a couple of times, actually, Paul Doherty, who is Accenture's chief technology and innovation officer. Um, and so, so they are a good example of innovation. Uh, so what, what advice have you got for companies to not fall prey to that innovation antibody syndrome? Well, a few things. Uh, so I've worked with uh, and for 11 different Fortune 1000 companies, helping them with various new division, new product launches and innovation efforts. You need executive sponsorship from the very top of the organization. The CEO needs to say, innovation is important and I'm going to stand behind it. Uh, if you don't have that senior level executive sponsorship, there will be other dynamics that emerge that make innovation difficult or impossible. Um, you need to have a dedicated function around uh, identifying new opportunities and incubating them. And then you need, and in that protected environment, that kind of greenhouse that's separate from the, the main organization, so it's not a distraction. But then you need a, a translation mechanism that allows that new idea, once you've matured enough, to, to make its way into the mainstream organization. Um, and a number of the large banks, for example, have begun adopting this model. So BBVA is a great example of a large bank that has created a successful innovation function that's also able to bridge those new ideas into the, the broader organization. David, I've seen uh, chief innovation officers in some cases fall prey to the organization paying lip service to the desire to innovate, but not funding it properly, or even more likely creating incentives for the organization to not innovate. So you have this kind of schizophrenia in some instances. Yeah, we, we call that innovation theater when you know the organization kind of dances to the tune of innovation on a, on a, a show and tell basis, but doesn't actually do anything in, in a substantive fashion. And, and so, uh, um, again, we come back to this idea, if you have C-suite sponsorship and you align budget and incentives and you have a disciplined process that says, okay, now that we've done 100 experiments and we've found the five things that we want to move forward, we're going to put serious resources behind them and, and fund the three to five year development chain that it will take to get from that sort of early stage idea to, uh, uh, to successful you know, scale business. Now, another issue is uh, sometimes big companies don't have the patience for that three to five year cycle. And in that case, they'll innovate through acquisition. Um, and there, there's a, a whole other set of rules around making sure that if you are going to innovate through acquisition, if you're going to say, look, we have a low cost of capital, so our best way to innovate is to acquire, that you don't kill the thing that you just bought. <laughs> that You have an intelligent way of, of bringing its best qualities into your organization without uh, 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 destroying what it is that you acquired in the first place. Okay. Final, final advice for large companies. I know you've been giving a lot of advice, but what's the, what's the hardest single problem they face when they try to innovate and, and take advantage of these disruptive technologies? Um, embracing an innovation mindset. You know, it, I actually find that a lot of big companies are filled with great ideas but people get tentative. They have trouble bringing it forward to leadership. Leadership is focused on something else and has trouble focusing or listening to these ideas as they come forward. So, so helping reframe your thinking around being willing to try the new and being willing to embrace the new idea uh, is probably the hardest thing that these organizations have uh, in terms of, of, of making the shift and, and something that they really need to invest the most in, in, uh, in developing. Okay, I want to remind everybody we're speaking with David Schreier. He's a futurist. He's an entrepreneur. He is the author of this book, Trust Data. That's it. As well as a bunch of other books. So 
Let's talk about analytics and data. We hear of these, you know, catchphrases, data is the new oil. Not sure what exactly that means, but it sounds good. But we know data is really important. So what is, why? What's going on with data with analytics, David? You know, because of more and more ubiquitous devices. So I'm, I'm speaking to you now through an iPhone 10, which has a very pretty camera. So it makes for, for good sort of visuals. Uh, uh, as we have, and, and many people have like a, a, an Amazon Echo or a Siri, they have, a, you know, uh, some kind of device in their home. Um, and so, uh, um, uh, so as these connected devices get more and more ubiquitous, and as they have better and better sensors, and as the networks get better, we're generating more and more and more data uh, about ourselves, about our lives, about commerce, and about society. And what's interesting is that not only are we generating all that data, but the computing power and the sophistication of analytics are now reaching the point where we can understand this data. We can actually do something with it and make it useful. And so, for example, with artificial intelligence, people have been talking about the, the big wave of change that AI is going to drive for 40 or 50 years. But we've only started to see it come to fruition in the last 10 because the computers, the networks, the algorithms have finally gotten sophisticated enough to be useful. Um, and so, uh, so it's now a very, very exciting time if you're engaged in the world of, of data or analytics uh, because of the, the potential power to help make a better society. Dude, that's pretty abstract. Make a better society. I mean, elaborate on that one, please. Well, so there are a bunch of problems we can solve now that we had trouble solving before. There are a billion people in the world who lack a legal identity. They don't exist in the eyes of government. They're mostly women and children, and they're abused, and they're trafficked, and they're exploited. And so with, with the advent of newer technologies, uh, so the UN has set a Sustainable Development Goal, SDG 16.9, that says by 2030, everyone on the planet will have an identity. These new digital technologies can help create that identity in a way that's much less expensive and much more robust and much more useful. So, so my company is, is working now uh, with, with another company in the UN around providing uh, these digital identities to refugees. Um, there are three and a half billion people who are underserved or unserved by today's financial system. That's holding back economic growth and economic progress. 95% of the world's small businesses are underserved by banks. That's holding back economic progress because small businesses create four out of five new jobs. So all of these things can be better served and actually addressed through the new kinds of data and analytics that we can use leveraging technologies like artificial intelligence. How can companies of all sizes take advantage of these data and analytic capabilities? I mean, what kind of tool sets are needed? What kind of data? How should they be thinking about aggregating the data, collecting the data that they require? Well, so a couple of things, and you used an important word there. You said aggregating data. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But the first thing the organizations can do is improve their data literacy. People throw around words like data and analytics without really understanding what they, what they mean. People uh, uh, throw around uh, words like causality, which is essentially did thing over here A lead to event over here B. Um, a lot of people make assumptions about cause and effect that, that turn out to be false. So there's a, a wonderful book that I, I'm reading called The, the Book of Why, uh, which talks about this idea of causality. Um, so getting a better understanding of data and of just some basics of statistics. And I'm not saying you're going to become a data scientist or a data programmer. I'm saying that with a few weeks of training, uh, with a little bit of effort, the general manager can understand enough about data analytics to ask intelligent questions of their data scientists, and the data scientists should be able to answer those questions. Um, and so that level of data literacy, I think, is critical. Once you're asking the right questions, that can help mobilize your organization towards developing the right answers. So from a management perspective, it is essential to understand enough about data and analytics so you can ask the experts, ask your data scientists the right questions. And come up with the right strategies as well. So it's not only asking the right questions of your people, but also uh, um, coming up with strategies for how to marshal their resources. So uh, you just mentioned earlier this concept of data aggregation. 
Can companies be thinking about different ways to aggregate data? In, in the book, Trust Data, that we talk about, we actually espouse something different. We espouse what's known as a federated model, which means you don't aggregate the data. You don't do what Equifax did, which is put a lot of data into one giant pile and make it easy for hackers to get to. You leave the data in a more secure, distributed manner, and you send the algorithms to the data. You create different kinds of software, and you put them together with the data, and then the software generates answers off of this federated data. Um, and so understanding that new data architecture is also important. Um, GDPR, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, has been passed in Europe. It has implications not only for European companies, but for any company that does business with a European citizen. Even if they fly from Europe over to the U.S. and are walking around the U.S., if you're touching their personal data, you are subject in some fashion to GDPR. So this has caused a lot of consternation in uh, uh, corporate C-suites around what the heck do we do with GDPR and what does it mean for us? And longer term, these, these innovations in policy around things like GDPR and around PSD2 and some analogous and somewhat weaker uh, efforts going on in the U.S., these things will all actually create new business opportunity for companies as much as they are currently generating better protections for consumers. Understanding that changing landscape is something that is, it, it's not optional for, for a big company. Whether you're a healthcare company dealing with health records, or you're a social media company dealing with social media profiles, or uh, um, you're a bank dealing with bank data, uh, anyone who touches a consumer at any point needs to understand the new world of data and the new world of data privacy. Okay, we have a, a question from Twitter, and I'll just ask you to respond to this very briefly, because we have so much that we have yet to cover during this relatively short conversation. Arsalan Khan makes the important point that for many executives, for many managers, data means either blind acceptance or an excuse to veto something without fully understanding the implications. So how do we overcome that issue inside companies? Well, I think leadership needs to become more aware of the risks of that binary approach of just sort of throw everything out or just sort of say yes to everything, um, that creates real risk that can impact market cap to the tune of tens of billions of dollars. And I point you to exhibit A, Facebook's market cap. Facebook uh, is not an evil company. It's not a company that set out to destroy people's lives. Uh, that was not their mission. But through a failure to properly understand the nuances of the personal data that they were aggregating and using, um, they created tremendous shareholder value destruction. And, uh, and so they are now undergoing an effort to address that. But it's much better to close the barn door while the horse is still in the barn. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's talk about artificial intelligence and economics, the financial system. How is AI going to change our relationship to money? Gosh, I, AI is going to change our relationship to money in many ways, large and small. So at a macro level, let's say you're a decision maker inside of a corporation or inside of a bank, you want to understand, oh, I don't know, inflation. Inflation has an impact on your cost of capital, on your price of goods. It's all sorts of things that are relevant to how you manage your business. Well, in the old days, you'd go to a government statistics office and you'd have to wait six months, three months, six months, a year after the passage of time for them to provide you a backward-looking assessment of what was the inflation that quarter. Well, thanks to AI and thanks to smart machine systems and some clever algorithms, uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Professor Roberto Rigabon uh, at MIT Sloan, created a daily rate of inflation. So you're not waiting, you know, 12 months to find out what inflation was. You can see it in real time. And it's more accurate because it's based on real observations instead of on what turned out to be sometimes manipulated statistics from various government statistics offices. And so he now creates a daily rate of inflation for over 100 countries. Um, that's a powerful application of artificial intelligence that has profound, real, and wide-ranging uh, uh, effects for a corporation and value for management. In small ways, um, you know, our lives are made easier every day when we talk into our phone and say, you know, where is uh, that new restaurant that I want to go see? Where's the nearest Thai restaurant? 
or you know, uh, you know, what, what what's the address of that office I'm going to? I mean, it seems silly, but it's it's improved our lives in little ways and made us a little more efficient. What we can see coming in the next five to ten years is that those artificial intelligent agents that live on our little smart devices are going to get a lot smarter. They're going to customize to our particular interests and needs. So it'll be like having a buddy who's shadowing us, who anticipates what we need and puts it in front of us before we even explicitly ask for it. Um, and so, so that's a really exciting way that on a small scale, artificial intelligence is going to uh, uh, have an impact. But I was watching one of my favorite movies, uh, Cloud Atlas, uh, uh, the other night. And um, that little drop of innovation uh, uh, goes into a multitude of drops in the ocean. And so if we have people inside a company with these little AI buddies who are helping them be slightly more efficient, corporate productivity is going to skyrocket. What about uh, the impact uh, on jobs and the potential for worker displacement? There is profound potential for worker displacement thanks to AI if we're not careful. And I say that because um, some worker displacement is not a bad thing. We are reallocated resources in theory to something more efficient. If we do what uh, uh, our friends at Accenture did and retrain those people and invest in reskilling, then we've done a great thing. We've helped improve efficiency and we've redeployed people against higher order tasks. If we do what the steel industry in the British Midlands did in the, in the 80s or, or, or the US auto industry did in the 80s and 90s and use automation to just throw people out of work and not retrain them, we create a generation of people who are permanently unemployed and unemployable. And that's going to create political problems. It has already created political stress in the UK and the US, and it's going to get worse if we're not careful. Advice for managers, leaders inside large organizations who are reading about this stuff, hearing you talk and, fig and trying to say, how do I get ahead of this? So a few things that you can do if you're inside a big organization or if you're a startup entrepreneur, if you're a leader who is trying to grapple with these changes, um, first and foremost, get smarter about it, okay? So it's important that you build your data and analytics literacy. Second of all, um, invest in educating your people and, and keying them in on what they uh, uh, should be focused on, right? Keying them in on creating new businesses, supporting them when they come forward with new ideas. Um, and finally, uh, embrace the startups. I mean, the big companies have an opportunity to take advantage of all of this innovation from all over the world uh, using an open innovation model. And the very, very smartest ones are actually building innovation ecosystems. So this is a very sophisticated approach where you're saying we're not just doing open innovation and we don't just have a shingle out where we where you let people, you know, have an ideas box or something and submit ideas, but actually have a coordinated effort to engage with a number of different stakeholders within their industry segment who are pushing forward to the future and bringing that knowledge back to the large organization to then implement it and drive change at scale. A lot of what you've been talking about has been management making intelligent decisions about how they lead within with an open mind, essentially, open mindset. Let's talk about blockchain. We all hear about blockchain. <laughs> you know, we all, actually I was gonna say, we know Bitcoin is not blockchain, but a lot of people think Bitcoin is blockchain. So what the hell is blockchain? Okay, blockchain is very simply a better kind of database, right? It's distributed. So instead of, as I used in my example earlier, having all the data in one place in this big central repository that uh, um, you know is is attackable by hackers, um, you have it in lots of different places. A thousand copies of the database, and these copies of the database all talk to each other. So what that gives you is a few things. First of all, it gives you better transparency. So let's say you're using this blockchain for. Uh, auditing votes to make sure that uh, there was no double counting of votes or something. It becomes instant and trusted. Second of all, it's more cyber resilient. So if you want to steal money from a bank today, you don't go in with a gun. You go in with a hacker. And so $84 million was stolen from the Central Bank of Bangladesh by someone hacking into an old version of Microsoft Windows. So instead of having that one central database where someone changes a bit and they can steal $84 million, they now have to change a thousand copies of that database. So it's much, much, much more difficult to steal money from a bank. Um, and, and so 
you know, what's interesting about blockchain, this technology was developed originally by a bunch of people who didn't trust each other very much. They definitely did not trust the system. They didn't trust governments or banking institutions, but they trusted the technology. So we've created a kind of digital trust that now can be used for all sorts of, of activities uh, in a more cyber resilient and more robust fashion. Well, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting you, you describe it that way because one hears blockchain being discussed in the context of trust, blockchain enables trust, and yet you say that it grew out of distrust, the lack of trust. So maybe you can share, enlighten us on that uh, conundrum, if you will. Yeah, well, I mean, the original trust model was if I give my money to the bank, it's safe because the government stands behind the bank and everything will be okay. Uh, if you were a customer of Lehman Brothers, you discovered what was wrong with that assumption set. Um, remember, in 2008, uh, uh, or during the height of the financial crisis, there were a lot of people who were, were not just disillusioned with banks, but um, they were uh, facing the fact, and, and we still have this problem today, a lot of millennials are underemployed or unemployed. And so they feel the system has failed them. They've accumulated all of this debt for college, and they can't get a job, or they can't get a good job. And so that fosters mistrust in institutions, right? And so a bunch of hackers got together, computer programmers, and they said, hey, we're going to create digital trust. We're going to create something where you don't have to trust any one party. You don't have to trust the central banker. You don't have to trust the government. You can trust the network of software. And everyone can see what the software does, so everyone can validate that it's okay. And that was the birth of blockchain. Now, today, blockchain is still being used in these what we call semi-trustless or completely trustless environments, but it's being used for different purposes, including by mainstream corporations, which I think is a good thing. So, for example, um, a, a number of big banks have started setting up new kinds of trading vehicles where you know, different trading partners can trade with each other uh, and uh, uh, without revealing proprietary trading strategies, nonetheless, uh, exchange information or, 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 or transact. Um, one of the areas that I'm particularly excited about is around digital identity. So today, thousands of 10,000 financial institutions all over the world duplicate a lot of effort with each other. They end up uh, um, replicating the process of checking your paperwork out to make sure you're okay to do business with. And this drives a lot of cost in the system. It costs as much as $130 to onboard a new customer. Now, this creates a lot of exclusion. Because if your customer only has an average balance of $100, you can't afford to spend $130 onboarding them. Uh, and so that makes the poorest people not able to do business with these banks. Well, if we created a system where using blockchain as an example, you could stand up these identities and have a system for sharing that information in a trusted fashion and in a distributed fashion, you could dramatically lower the cost by two or three orders of magnitude. And now, we can bank the unbanked, and that's exciting. Okay, so let's let's talk about digital trust. And the, the first obvious question is, what is digital trust? Well, di digital trust, so what is trust, right? Trust is the belief that we can do business together or that if I say something to you, you can act on it and believe that it'll happen. Digital trust is a way of putting software code around that and saying that the software will make sure that whatever implied or explicit promise that we make each other is actually going to be followed through on. And then there's the concept of digital identity. And so what is then digital identity and how does that link back to the concept of trust? So digital identity is an effort to solve a broken technology problem that we have. Okay, so I mentioned earlier, uh, a, a billion people in the world lack a legal identity in the eyes of government, and, and three and a half billion have what I'll call imperfect identity attributes, meaning they either don't have a credit history or they have a credit history that has bad information, or for whatever reason, um, their identity is not matching up with their potential. Um, and so the systems behind how we deal with all this uh, date back to uh, King Artaxerxes I of Persia in, in you know, 480 BC, and, and you know, we, where he was giving somebody little clay tablets to use as their passport, uh, the prophet Nehemiah, if you're curious. And so, so we're using technology that goes back to clay tablets and cuneiform. And, and so we really need to update our technology for identity. So the concept of a physical passport 
is a broken model, right? It can be forged, it can be hacked. The problem people are dealing with in Europe right now is that more than 10% of Syrian passports are forgeries. And so you want to give humanitarian aid to all these refugees pouring into Europe, and yet, how do you know who's who? So we can use new technology. We can use these ubiquitous communication networks, new digital devices, new algorithms, artificial intelligence to create an identity that is not reliant on that piece of paper, but instead is using an understanding of who you are at a very fundamental level, what we call behavioral biometrics, uh, in order to craft something that can't be forged, can't, well, very difficult to forge, very difficult to hack, um, and has a number of interesting features around it, like it can help you get credit. So when you say uh, behavioral identity, what is that? Well, it turns out that um, how you go through your daily life is a unique way of identifying you as you. Elaborate on that point. How you hold your phone, how hard you press on the screen when you type in keystrokes, um, how you walk, where you go when you walk through your day. Those kinds of behavioral observations are something that your phone knows about you. And in our model, which is what we call self-sovereign, that information stays with you, is very secure, and you hold on to it. And then you can decide, yes, I would like an abstraction, an encrypted, anonymized version of that to then be used to let an organization like a bank do business with me. So for the sake of the non-technologists among us, what does that mean that you just said? Well, you know, English. right now, you don't own your personal data. Facebook does. And right now, you don't really control your credit file. Equifax does. And in the model that we propose, which we talk about in, in the book, Trust Data, um, instead, you control your personal data. It is up to you to decide who gets to look at it for when, for how long, and what's done with it. And so some of your personal data includes your personal behavior data, which we can use using our software to make a new identity around you that um, is more secure, uh, that can give you better, lower fraud rates, um, that can help you do business. So, so here in the U.S., for example, uh, if you want to use your credit card, it works 99.9% .9 of the time. But if you're in Colombia, it only works one time out of four because the fraud systems can't tell good guys from bad guys. If you're in Indonesia, it works one time out of two or Brazil. And so there's a lot of commerce in the world, about $360 billion a year, that's being held back because our current identity systems can't figure out who you are. And so now some of the poorer people in the world can actually do business, can actually grow their economies, can get the goods and services they want because we can use this better digital identity to create a, a better relationship between them and, and the merchant or the bank. Okay, so it seems like you're raising two issues. Number one is how do we identify somebody as you were just describing? And then number two is where does that data reside and who owns it. And so my question is... And I think those two need to be linked. The fact of who you are and where the data that identifies who you are, those, those, those two things you, you should not separate. Why? Uh, because it creates issues around abuse and cybersecurity if you do separate them. If you create a big pile of personal data about you that you have no control over, uh, that creates opportunity for hackers, as has been demonstrated by the Equifax hack and several other personal data hacks. All three billion Yahoo email accounts were compromised. Anthem's, uh, Anthem Health's 44 million health records were compromised. The list goes on. We've, we've had major cyber breaches, which will get much more difficult if we keep the data federated. All right. So... But, but aren't you fighting now the business model? You mentioned Facebook, just as an example. You're fighting the business model of Facebook to own that data. And all of these various companies that you're describing have their business model does not include allocating the resources necessary to safeguard that data. And so you're, you're fighting the tide of human history, human tendency, and human psychology, not to mention economics. I'm not doing it alone. So regulations have changed. And in particular in Europe, Europe, GDPR is a seismic shift in the ownership and control of personal data. Um, that came out of, uh, in part, some of the World Economic Forum's gr uh, working group's efforts around digital privacy. 
uh, which uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Sandy Pentland at MIT, was was instrumental in in driving, and um, and so uh, uh, so there's a new a new approach that's actually the law of the land in Europe, and the U.S. seems to be moving more rather than less in that direction, um, and so if you're a big company whose business model relies on uh, um, monetizing personal data, you now have to deal with a new set of rules. In addition, there are some commercial imperatives because uh, um, personal data is getting more useful and more valuable. And so I've spoken to a number of financial institutions that have said, just as we are custodians of financial assets, in the future, we're going to be custodians of personal data and personal identity assets. Uh, and so there are actually very large, very, very large uh, commercial enterprises that are pursuing this model of of sort of data, uh, personal data custodianship and, and federated personal data. What's the time frame? Do you suppose for for this to this being the ownership of personal data, the control of personal data, the time frame for this to be to proliferate more broadly? Would you say I, I, it's three to five years on the on the legal ownership of it? Uh, it's probably seven to ten years on the the monetization of that new landscape. Uh, and the gap between three years and 10 years is where a lot of innovation and, and market disruption and opportunity is going to be created. Uh, so as I, uh, as I mentioned, the GDPR in Europe has made this the law of the land, that you now own your personal data if you're a European citizen. But what does that really mean? People need more data literacy to understand that they now can do things with their data that they couldn't do before. Um, open banking and, and PSD2 are other regulations that, again, make it easier for people to take control of their personal financial data that they couldn't do before. But now companies need to step forward. Startups largely are entering this space, but bigger companies now as well to say, hey, here's what you can do now that you have ownership and control of your personal data. And we, XYZ startup or we large financial institution are going to help you do that. Um, and so that is going to play out over the next decade. So, David, we're we're almost out of time, but w among the things that you have spoken about is uh, what's happening in different regions of the world, like like China, India. We expect that, but but Latin America, that's unexpected. There's a lot of innovation going on in Latin America. Uh, the Inter American Development Bank is driving a lot of efforts to to uh, improve. Uh, financial access and to address the fact that 50% uh, of, of Latin American adults are, are underbanked or unbanked. Um, in Brazil, for example, 72% uh, of the population lacks access to credit, uh, the adult population, and there are new technologies and new opportunities to, to open up those markets. Um, so I believe that if these efforts are successful, we're going to see a new kind of prosperity emerging in Latin America and in Southeast Asia, and in Africa, and in various regions around the world. The, the MENA region, for example, uh, the Arab world, 92% of the Arab world is underbanked or unbanked. And there's an opportunity to address that with new technology. So to what extent will technology be the driver of uh, significant global improvement? And how, what's the mechanism by which that will take place? So there's an opportunity for technology to be an enabler of change around the world, it's going to take courageous leadership and innovative entrepreneurs to actually turn that into results. It's not enough to just invent a new technology. We have to solve a problem. And we have to have people who know how to solve problems building organizations around that new solution. And that's where innovation and entrepreneurship is, is so exciting for me. Uh, and we've, we've created some programs, for example, at, at University of Oxford to, to help people create those new businesses, right? So OxfordFintech.org and OxfordBlockchain.org are, are two of the websites that, that tee up our classes where we help people figure out how to build these new, new businesses and new ventures. Are there other parts of the world that you're seeing a lot of activity that we should be aware of that maybe we're not? Well, I think that people don't know enough about what's going on in China to really understand how profound it is. So China is its own uh, uh, ecosystem of dramatic change and innovation around financial services and more broadly di digital technology. And a lot of it happens behind the Great Firewall, so we don't see it here. But some of the largest organizations that have been doing this, like the BATS, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, 
uh, and a few others. Uh, Credit Ease is now beginning to, to look more globally. Um, these organizations uh, have, have refined new kinds of technology that we don't, we don't really have an awareness of elsewhere in the world. And so its impact on our lives is likewise potentially quite profound as it begins to emerge from behind the Great Firewall. Um, and so, so I would say China is probably the biggest place where we don't, we don't understand enough in Western Europe or the U.S. what's going on there and what it could mean for our lives. What does it mean for, for the U.S.? Technology out of China and the innovation and the fact we're not even aware of what's, what's happening. Well, in the U.S., we're in the middle of a trade war right now, and, and um, the Western nations, particularly the Five Eyes countries, are getting more aggressive about prohibiting Chinese technology from being used, uh, Huawei most notably in the headlines around that. Um, and so, uh, so we're, we're good. It's, it's a little hard to tell because we have these exogenous factors of, of political activity that are impacting market activity. So if we didn't have political intervention, I would say that um, the big Chinese companies are begin, going to be getting into a shooting war with Facebook and Amazon and, and Netflix and Microsoft and Google uh, over this new kind of technology, these new generation digital data analytics and, and AI. Um, but with the political interventions, you know, we may see some homegrown solutions that don't take advantage of some of the ideas coming out of China. Um, that may or may not have a long-term uh, impact on us. I tend to be more in favor of open borders rather than closed borders. But, uh, um, you know, we are a very innovative country, and it's very possible that we'll be fine without what's coming out of China. But I would not sleep soundly at night if I were a global executive, because not every country has engaged in a trade war with China. And if the U.S. becomes more insular, uh, those other countries are going to be able to take advantage of the collaboration opportunities. David, uh, going back to the issue of data ownership, given the differences in Chinese and the Chinese political system and prevailing attitudes in China, are they going to be saddled with the same kind of uh, disruptions, shall we say, around the management of personal data that people in this country are going to have to be dealing with over the next decade or so. That, that's where the, the analogy breaks down when you look at how uh, the Chinese government has decided to handle personal data. So the government owns it. So it's not a question of do you own it or not. And in fact, the government is using it to manage society. And so whether or not you can get travel papers and whether or not you can get a loan and whether or not you get an apartment is increasingly being governed by what the digital networks say about how well you collaborate with your neighbors and how well you obey the party dictates. Um, so it's uh, to someone from the U.S., it may look a little bit like Black Mirror, but I am very cautious about cultural relativism, and it seems to work for them. Um, I would not recommend the Chinese model applied to the U.S. or you know the Commonwealth. So in, so in China, it's a uh, relatively simple solution enabled by very complex technology. And the solution is government owns it all. The uh, government has actually been proactive in preventing abuse against its citizens by corporations because that's infringing on the government monopoly. What advice do you have for American or Western uh, European policymakers regulators, legislators regarding these issues? So I spend a lot of time talking to policymakers and regulators in the UK, uh, uh, continental Europe, the European Commission, the European Parliament, as well as in the US. And, and what I say to them is, uh, you want to get a lot more sophisticated about these technologies, not unlike what I say to, to C-suite executives. You want to get smarter about them and understand what questions to ask that your subject matter experts, that your technical experts can answer. Um, when crafting policy, you want to open up opportunity and innovation, and you want to have a light touch. So in, in another book we've written called Frontiers of Financial Technology, we, we have a, a pretty lengthy chapter about regulation and innovation policy. And one of the things that we talk about is that uh, we use the e-commerce regulation that the U.S. put forward as an example of creating safety for consumers and consumer protections without inhibiting growth of a new industry. 
And so companies like Amazon and Netflix were able to be successful because we were able to solve a lot of problems through policy that enabled their businesses to grow, while at the same time, we were able to create consumer protections. Uh, and so similarly, for things like artificial intelligence and uh, blockchain and, and data analytics, uh, I would be cautious about over-regulating. I would also be cautious about under-regulating. I think it's important to fight, find the right balance. And the only way to do that is active consultation with industry and academia to make sure that you design policy that, that suits the purpose. Okay, well, I'm afraid we're out of time. David Schreier, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Thank you, Michael, it was a pleasure. We've been speaking with the futurist David Schreier. Here is his book, Trust Data. It's one of many books he's written. He is with the MIT Media Lab. He founded a company called Distilled Analytics. He has a pretty extraordinary career, and uh, so you can check him out online. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Before you go, please subscribe on YouTube. Do that right now. And would you please tell a friend, tell your colleagues about CXO Talk. We have lots of amazing videos, and we'll be back next week with another show. Thanks so much, everybody, and I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.